Hello, everyone. I am here today on behalf of the Irish Cultural Center in Hammersmith, London. Edna O'Brien is one of the patrons of the Cultural Center and the board of the ICC is delighted that she has agreed to record this interview as part of our Autumn 2021 Literary Festival. And Edna, I have been asked to pass on their thanks to you. You also have my thanks, of course, for making this all possible. Um, so there is a, a decided theme to my questions today. And there's a part of your writing that I think really we can start looking at a little bit differently that's come into particular significance in recent times. And that is the way that you have always very sensitively handled rendering the natural world and talking about our human relationship to the environment. Uh, as early as 1988 in The High Road, you have a character referred to the thrushes of the world as being contaminated by the Chernobyl disaster, for example. And more recently in your short story, Inner Cowboy, the protagonist uh, witnesses a massive oil spill that gets covered up. So while these, these issues aren't necessarily at the center, they surround everything that happens in a number of texts. Um, and, you know, our connection to the natural world has actively been discouraged and we seem to have lost the feeling for nature that uh, has been kind of seen as irrelevant in pursuit of material gain, progress, those kinds of uh, values. Um, so what I'd like to discuss with you then is the importance of the natural world in your work and life. In a recent event there in London at the embassy, uh, at, on the occasion of your having donated some of your uh, papers to the National Library of Ireland, you mentioned the trees of your youth and you grew up in, a, uh, in rural County Clare, a part of the country that you have said yourself is not exactly known as a beauty spot. However, it was a setting that really fired your young imagination and was very evocative for you. Uh, it seems very clear from any of your autobiographical writings such as your 2012 memoir, um, Country Girl, uh, in which you said, quote, in my daft ambition to be a writer, I was studying nature. And that really caught my eye because you seem to be making very clear the connection between studying nature and writing. And I guess for my first question, I'm just wondering what you could say more about the link between your childhood immersion in and love of your natural surroundings and the first stirrings of your literary creativity. You know, trying to absorb everything you've said. Uh, what you're asking me, I believe, is how nature affected in my childhood and henceforth my writing, my life. It's true for everyone. W.B. Yeats said of himself, the sea cliffs of Sligo gave tongue to his words. That was his very early poetry. And in my own case, the abundance of nature and the nature of the nature that I grew up in definitely informed how I wrote. I lived among trees, grasses, forts of trees, the sounds of running little rivers and streams, uh, pasture, bogland, it was all, it was, if you like, or seemed, uh, though nothing is ever that gentle, it seems gentler in description. It was also rather wild in winter and storms. And what I thought, not at the time, because one does not think at the time, one absorbs, what I thought and think in retrospect, how the variation of seasons, the wonder of the variation of seasons alters or it affects our mood and our, therefore, whatever we write or however we are engaged with other people. To me, the outdoors constituted something of a miracle. Uh, there was, one was away from any domestic storms, which feature in every household. And I also being of a, shall we say, a, a highly strong temperament, uh, conversed in my own way, my own foolish way, as it was thought, with trees. I had read somewhere, I can't remember where, 
But I had read or dreamt or been told by Biddy Early or Biddy Early's <laughs> successors, the trees had a spirit life. And therefore that spirit was sentient to everything that was going on. And therefore one could talk with the trees. The first things, little nonsense pieces I ever wrote, I always wrote them out of doors and I always wrote them under trees or near trees. We, we were very lucky in where I grew up. It's called Drewsborough House. It had been owned by a landlord and uh, later my father's family who made some money, some priests in Boston and who were famous for the invention of a medicine that was supposed to be a cure-all. Turned out, I think it was just cod liver oil, but that's another story. So they bought uh, for my father this place called Drewsborough, and it was a lot of land, a lot of acres. And what I loved and didn't realize then is how much more imaginative as a country landscape it was than the tapered lawns or beauty spots that I sometimes later came to see. It was wilder and it allowed oneself, me as a child, to wander more. And in those wanderings, I do not exaggerate when I say to you that I thought this place in its way, I was very religious, and what I'm about to say now seems slightly irreligious, the parts of this place, Drewsborough, one paddock in particular, that was canopied with trees and briars and blackberries and God knows what else, I called it heaven. Why I chose heaven was that it was the place I was able to be alone because I liked being alone. It was the only place I felt free from the stricture of adults or teachers or grown-ups uh, and it was also a place where I don't know the miracle never happened I should add except one existed it was a place where something supernatural and I'm not again I'm not being fanciful I've been accused of that at times but that's human beings uh, I thought some sort of revelation or miracle might occur there. So without rambling on and trying to give you a fairly succinct answer, I would say that nature was one of the main four stimuluses, if there is such a word, stimuli, of my life. For instance, my mother and father, when they married in 1922, they, my mother had been, she'd come home from America where she worked in Brooklyn and she got engaged very quickly to the man who had all this land um, and trees. They went back to Brooklyn for a while and my father couldn't stand it. Uh, he couldn't, he missed, the ho he missed horses, he loved horses. He missed going to race, race meetings, even point to point or anything so long as he was with horses, and he hated Brooklyn. My brother was actually born in Brooklyn, and but for the fact of money perhaps running out a bit and my father's malcontent, I would have been born and raised in Brooklyn, to which I've gone back sometimes on a, well, I can't call it a memory visit, on some curious curiosity visit. So the whole nature I've often discussed this, but well not often, but I did discuss this with my friend Philip Roth, how he, he grew up in New Jersey in an urban situation, how our locality, our locale, both internal and external, because they're wedded, uh, decides or informs the kind of person we are. And if you happen to be a writer or want to be a writer, it informs that. So that was the good side of nature, this, the, what I call the abundant side. There was also 
the fearful side in that the, the woods at night seem to me to be very dangerous places. There are a lot of barking dogs, pole cats, um, animal foxes, badgers. A war went out in the woods that in the day I would walk very happily. So it invoked fear and of course in storms and so on, the violence of nature, that nature or was a creature of, 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 of beneficence and nature was a creature of destruction. I'm not of course talking of the destruction that has now been done to nature, to the world that we're, we all know and somehow don't do that much about or don't even fully know what to do exactly about and neither do leaders who talk about great schemes what they talk about is not always what they carry into force so nature for me was was part of my not only my education it was part of my temperament and i'm very thankful I have other reasons perhaps to be unthankful, but I'm very thankful to have grown up in that place where, you know, to look out a window and in the middle of everything else to see uh, primroses and things. When I first saw, for instance, flowers, wild flowers, I must have been two or three or maybe less, because one could ramble a little bit outside, you know, in the fields near the house. I couldn't believe that where there had been a cow pack the day before and donkeys and this and that, the primroses, are, because the color of primroses and the color of cowslips has never left me, my mind. I love uh, dresses or silk dresses that are that very, very pale, pale, milky yellow. So it's another just tiny example of the things that informed me. But I think I probably, I, I said your question was a bit over long. Well, maybe my answer is a bit over over long. No, I, I, the, I suppose my, my first question was really partly providing some context for wh where we were going with the questions. I, I would like to say one thing that I forgot to mention and then we'll continue. In one of my books, uh, because there's not only nature, but there is the history in, embedded in all the fields and roads and rocks and everything else of Ireland, of every country. In the, my book, House of Splendid Isolation, it begin, which is about an IRA man who comes to the South uh, on a duty, if I may call it, it begins by saying history is everywhere. It seeps into the soil, the subsoil, like rain or hail, or snow, or some, I forget, a house remembers, an outhouse remembers, a people ruminate, the tale differs with the teller. And I found that which I wrote many, many years ago, I wrote it long before I began that book because I thought how uh, a country, if our country, historically informs us as well. What we read, what happened, and what we witnessed, what happened. And then how in our prejudices or in our forgetfulness or in whatever else, how we alter and reconstruct many of these um, things we have observed. There was something I disliked immensely that was a great fashion for um, re reinterpreting there's a word for it which you'll be able i hope to tell me words for the famine or for anything else i think it was called was it reconstruction revisionist, was it? revisionist. revisionist history is it revisionist history? exactly yeah. which i don't uh, trust i'd like to say because revisionist is usually done by people who want to deny certain facts. The revisionism is done by people who want their own political agenda at the forefront. And the idea 
of truth, of, of everything, the, the model that is life, the ambiguity that is life, they want that silenced. So I'm glad you remembered revisionism. I wrote it down last night to remember it, but there, you brought it again, you brought it back. Um, yes, so I mean, you've touched on a number of questions I was actually going to raise, and maybe we'll pick up with what you're just saying there, which which was amongst my questions. So, you know, primroses and trees and things you can find in lots of landscapes, but I think you're touching on something that's quite specific about the Irish landscape, which has been so shaped by, you know, occupation, you know, the ridges that could be old fortifications and even the, you know, the drains and the ditches that the Tudors kind of introduced. Um, do you, and you talk, talking about the famine in the Mother Ireland, you talked about the soul of the land crying out. Do you feel there's something, I mean, you have already hinted at this, that there's something that the history is actually alive through the connection with the natural world in Ireland. And because it seems like that comes out in a number of your- Oh, novels. absolutely. It's alive in the United States. It's alive in Ireland. It's alive in Bosnia, which I wrote about. It's alive yeah. everywhere. It, uh, it, you know, gets, so to speak, altered or gets not forgotten, but sidelined. For instance, um, where I grew up in County Clare, there was an area, uh, a townland near our townland called Bodike. And my, as I've often said, my education in the national school was rather scat scattered. In many ways, it was rich, but I wouldn't call it entirely and utterly logic. Our, and I'll come to the landscape in a second. Our teacher was, was quite marvelous, but histrionic creature. And she would get us to recite with infinite passion. Um, and this was about the, the invader. It was uh, particularly about Queen Elizabeth I and Shane O'Neill that part of history. And the poem was, or the recitation, did they dare, did they dare to slay Ongro Onyu? Yes, they slew with poison, him they feared to meet with steel. May God wither up their hearts, here comes the prayer. May their blood cease to flow. May they walk in living death, who poisoned Owen Roe. So you hear a poem like that, you feel it, uh, and naturally, it becomes part of your version of the, and in this instance, truthful part of your sense of the history of a place. Even more realistic for me and for those around me and have been written about uh, were the evictions. Evictions, I was born in 1930, but evictions went on not, I mean, 40, 50 years earlier, they were still alive in people's minds. And my mother's family, the Clearies, had been evicted from the, 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 the ripe, um, the fertile, fertile land of County Kildare. And they traveled all the way across Ireland, across Bog of Allen, to a mountainous region in, in, in County Clare, it was called Middle Iron. Now, that sense of th that, just that knowledge of the eviction and reading descriptions, they didn't describe it to me, but there was a lot written about what they, the Bodaic evictions, because it was fairly within recent memory, yeah. not my memory, but older people. And the very idea of the, the dread of the evictions and the morning when uh, the, the, they weren't called guards then, uh, I suppose they were called police, came with the crowbars and the people, you know, were got out of their houses and their pigs and calves or whatever, hens, everything was taken. And the sight of people, just that evening, a house in ruin and a people's lives also in ruin, that happened. It's not me uh, trying to be uh, over Celtic or inventing some uh, sort of high flown, highly colored picture. It happened 
And therefore, as a person learning and finding her or his way in life, that sense of injustice played a very strong part in the kind of person I became. I dislike injustice, whether it's Irish injustice, English injustice, Donald Trump injustice, or anyone else's injustice. And the world is very rich in injustice now. So the character that is formed is very complex. It is, of course, the loveliness of the, the, uh, the nature when it's smiling. It is how trees talk back to one. It is the fertility of verdure and of bees, butterflies. When I would go to the bog with the bottle of tea for our workman, it was like walking through a, a, such an exotic land of bees, bumblebees, butterflies. Everything was humming, everything was alive. So I have that. I have a sense of what happened in the land itself. Uh, it was also true that we became very poor, but so did a lot of people around us because of the economic war. And therefore, the, if you like, the legacy that the country has given to me and has given to you or to anyone is very, very uh, full and it's contradictory in ways. It's sometimes prideful, it's sometimes shaming, it sometimes makes one angry. And sometimes when I've started to write about other worlds like Nigeria or Bosnia or different worlds that I have explored and researched for my books, I think in so many ways how protected we were. I wasn't living during the time of the famine. I was not evicted. We were broke, but that was at all the world's fault. It was partly our own fault. So it is interesting how some people retain, especially in the United States, although it may be lessening, a nostalgia for a country that really has much more to it than the idea of nostalgia. What I have, I hope, retained from my country is a persistence in my own nature, a persistence of the search for what is. Now, my search for what is, is not your search or that girl or that man's search. And therefore, you are both the result and product of your country, its history, its nature, its everything else. And you are your own convoluted self who makes her or his own narrative of that. There are many Irish writers long before me and present time. And although their books may be set in Ireland or in Dublin, as the great and unmatchless James Joyce did. Uh, they have the flavor of Ireland, but they differ so much. And Joyce was certain of himself enough. Joyce, as you probably know, is my ultimate teacher and hero. I would not have written one line, whatever it is I've written, whatever worth it is or it hasn't, it has or it hasn't, but whatever I have done, has been through educating myself on James Joyce, not copying James Joyce, which many people do, rather embarrassingly, I feel, but realizing that within his extraordinary text is the pulse, the permanent pulse of feeling. Feeling is everything. Feeling is what makes us love. Alas, feeling is what makes us hate. And although Joyce wrote this extraordinary, with this extraordinary stream of language that's cosmic, you wonder how one mind 
could could write Ulysses, how one mind could write it and not go mad, and maybe he did go mad, or partly mad, anyhow. Uh, it's the feeling underneath that is important. And I felt or feel I was lucky enough to grow up, because you're asking me uh, about my na nature and history and childhood, to grow up in a very, it was both secret and convivial. There were a lot of secrets, but mostly those secrets came out one way or another. So I grew up with stories. I've read lately some writer, I can't remember, Irish said he wasn't interested in stories. Well, I'm sorry to say stories are deep down from the time of Adam and Eve. Uh, stories are the nub of literature. The language then is what makes literature good, bad, or great. But the story must be there in order for the communication to happen in that transaction between reader and writer. It's a very private transaction. You reading a book, any book, and I reading the same book will probably glean from it different things. In a generalized way, we will say, well, it was good or bad or whatever. So I feel that I was lucky, despite, uh, you know, some handicaps. Yes, so I, I think, well, I will have just maybe just one last question for you that maybe pulls together some of the things that you have said in your answers so far. And something that strikes me about James Joyce, a lesson that you seem to have learned, and I think when it comes to your handling of the landscape, is not to sanitize or sentimentalize, right? You show the cowpat as well as the primrose. It is. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's part of kind of getting at the kind of the truth. And um, I suppose also what you're saying, I think is very interesting about the connection between st story or narrative and an appreciation of the environment, right? So those, those stories of injustice that your teacher told you or the, the mythology that's embedded in the landscape that clearly was influential. Um, and I suppose my last question then would be pulling at some of those threads. Uh, in your the, the novel that you mentioned, you know, Girl, your most recent novel set in Nigeria, the scenes in the forest, there's a lot of scenes in the forest in that novel that are that some of them are quite vivid, they're painful, they're terrifying, and yet they're very comforting and restorative. There's all different kinds of re, uh, you know, experiences that Mariam has in the forest. Um, and it seems to me the natural world, and I think you really said this uh, today, uh, provides for you a kind of a store of language and imagery that helps you investigate the complexity of our human nature. And I suppose what my last question is, do you feel artists bear any kind of responsibility for creating a sense of connection between the human reader uh, who's reading your, your, your novel or your story and the non-human world for which we seem to have, you know, kind of abdicated responsibility, but in which we are embedded, we are part of the natural world. So do you feel that the writer, the writer's job, is it the writer's responsibility to foster a feeling of connection between ourselves and the natural world, a, a connection that is been increasingly lost in recent times? I, I think it is a responsibility, but it is also very difficult to impose. Uh, some people write, let's, let's take a couple of examples of books that were really only about the natural world. One is a favorite book of mine, uh, written by a clergyman in Sherborne in England. And it had the word, has the word Sherborne in the title. And he wrote to other clergymen daily about every minutiae of nature. So he not only honored a responsibility of that, he brought to the attention of his readers, the other clergymen that he wrote to, how magical and mysterious and confounding and cunning and everything else 
the, which included animals and birds as well, the world of nature was. And that was his, not, not his duty, because uh, that's too generous of a word, but that was his intention. Wordsworth did the same to a great extent, and so did his marvelous sister, Dorothy Wordsworth, who trudged along behind Wordsworth, carrying all the bags and flasks of tea, while William sort of, you know, what levitated at William and Coldridge and poor old Dorothy had to write down what the sound of the brook was like, or what the tinker ate when he sat on a, sat by them on a stone, tinker ate whatever they gave him. So in that kind of writing, the writer sets out, and there's an English writer at present time, Robert McFarlane, who writes beautifully yeah. about nature and in, in a way, not, doesn't compel us, but invites us to want to read it. I think in my own case, and in a lot of Irish writers where landscape does play a very strong part, it is not a backdrop, but it is not the main gist or purpose of the story. It is in some sense, if you like, a beguilement to, to draw us in, but, it, but it, it's not extraneous, but it's not central to what it is. If, if in any of my books, in the forest, all my books are thought to be rather in some way or other dangerous, which I'm very proud of. Uh, they're going to get more dangerous. Um, my great teacher was Pather O'Donnell, who edited a magazine, and I'll come back to your question in a minute. He edited a magazine called The Bell, which was a literary bell when I was working in a chemist shop in Dublin. So I wrote reams and reams of pretty awful stories. Didn't have money for stamps, but did have a bicycle. So on my half day, every fortnight from the chemist shop, I would deliver another six pages of gushing prose. And Paolo O'Donnell was a wonderful man, Donegal, and he was very, very kind to me. He was so kind, and he knew I wanted more than anything, more than life itself, to write. That was what I wanted and tried and failed and tried. And he gave me one piece of advice. He said, don't put so much of the nature and the gush in. He said, think of a writer as the headlights of a car going down a road in darkness, but showing up everything that is secret. So secrecy, by secrecy, I mean the exposing of secrecy, of secrets, be they moral or political or whatever. So it would be probably more fair to say that what I try to do, nature is, is the locale, nature is the backdrop for all my stories, including Nigeria. And when you said a moment ago that they were comforting, they are comforting, but in a very different way. There, it, it gets so hot and the houses are shacks out in the country that people go out under trees for shelter. The rain for, I was there twice in the rainy season and in the dry season. The rain is such that unless you can find a tree to hide under your, you're drenched, you're drowned almost. And most of all, the fruit, the nuts, and the kernels of the fruits and the nuts, the trees yield to the very hungry person. I was astonished that for the first time I would see a woman or a man, but I saw more women than men in Nigeria, out in the country, the women working on the farms and everything. I saw men also, but anyhow, I would see women breaking up the kernel of a peach stone, for instance, or breaking up the kernel of an avocado stone and finding a nourishment or a use within it. 
so the trees in or nature in Nigeria wasn't comforting in the way we would think of it. Yeah. It was, it's a necessity. Yeah. Yeah, Without yeah. their forests and their trees, both their herds, their cattle, and themselves would starve. And I am glad that you found some comfort in girl. I'm searching for it myself rather helplessly. It's too late now. But what I wanted or hoped uh, my readers would find would be the, first of all, the situation of girls captured and uh, harmed for life in every way, mentally, spiritually, bodily, and every other way. And the question I used to ask myself, and in my very early childhood, I asked myself the question when I saw things that troubled me or saddened me or I felt things, was well, what is it? What is that gene in mankind that makes us survive? They have so little in Nigeria that finding a tiny little seed within a stone is a bit of nourishment. Now you could say, without being in any way uh, sentimental or, or soppy about it, that is a great part of life. People's existence is so shorn, so threatened, and so brave, that they have to search in every manner that they can to keep going. And really what I suppose the word I want to repeat or impress upon myself as well as anyone who might be looking or listening is the tenaciousness, the, the will, the wish, and the drive, inner drive to survive. It's the most marvelous thing. It's the most mysterious thing. And I would imagine in the four walls of a prison or whatever, or in those camps where hundreds, thousands of people have been, not for weeks or months, but for years, how the, the gene of survival lasts. I love that. I admire that. I would like, but I'm not capable of one long poem. I read. I read a lot of poetry, well, my eyesight is gone now, but I used to read a lot of poetry and prose and often about distant and painful things as well as known things. And I, I sometimes glimpsed the thing I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's just, it's beautiful and it makes us better to be aware of it, to witness it, and to try and live it. That is, that, that is wonderful. I, uh, the idea of witnessing the beauty of life amidst its hardships uh, and its challenges. Uh, I think that's a, a nice place for us to wrap up. And the words uh, beguiling and tenacious that you uh, use there, I think also can be used to describe your own work as a writer. I mean, not only the, the the fiction and the, the the drama, et cetera, that you've produced, but but the spirit that you bring to your writing and that you have really, we're finally appreciating how much you've done for not just Ireland, but for, for literature around the world. And I thank you, Edna, again, for giving us this time and for giving us uh, so much uh, to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you for the questions. <laughs> L large and small. <laughs> and thank you to the two people who have disappeared. And I hope it was okay. I'm not used to doing Zoom, so I'm not bad at home with them, but I hope we managed. And thank you very much.